Okay, I hope you all had a good break um, and welcome back. And this is our first session of the day, our first panel discussion of the day. Um, and the title of the discussion is Leveraging Capital, the Role of Asset Owners in Transitioning Capital Markets. And we have a fantastic group of speakers who I think together, if you look at assets owned or assets managed, have around $3 trillion between them in their institutions, which would make a bit of a dent in some of the numbers that we were hearing about earlier today. Um, so just to quickly introduce them, uh, Liu Zhumi next to me, who is the Chief Investment Officer for Fixed Income and Multi-Asset at GIC. Snora Gierda, who is the Lead Investment Stewardship Manager, Corporate Governance at Norgas Bank Investment Management. Uh, we have, uh, my, my notes are bad, sorry, Liong Wei Leng, who's Managing Director and Regional Head of Asia PAC for Caisse de Depot et Placement du Québec, one of the big Canadian pension funds. And uh, last but not least, Tuhar Chow, who's Head of Fixed Income Asia uh, Rubico. Now, we were just talking before we got on stage about how we've set the scene for today already, and we'll get straight into it. So let's get straight into it then. Jimmy, what's stopping you doing more in terms of investing in transition finance? Wow, I didn't expect this to start like that. Um, where, where shall I start? I mean, if you think about it, um, I think it's important to understand that as asset owners, I think we can look at the transition in two cents, right? One of it is around understanding the risk in the stock of uh, existing positions we have in our portfolio. We're not just set up yesterday. We have been around for a long time. And most asset owners will find that if you look at your current portfolio, you have a big chunk of it that is under what we call transition risk. Um, if you look at, say, MSCI, uh, as an example, MSCI Equity World Index, you have something like 7% in green assets category where these are sustainable assets such as renewable energy and so on. On the other extreme of what we call a very dirty, a very high carbon emissions asset, this is about 10% of the index and that's really contributes something like 40% of the wacky of the total index. And then everything in, in the middle um, is what we call transition and that's 83%. So I think the starting point for everyone with an existing portfolio is to recognize that, you know, even if you don't want to do anything else, having a sense of what your portfolio looks like in terms of that transition risk, and then what are you going to do about it, I think is very important. Now, then, then the second point is around the flow question in terms of opportunities. And if you look at um, in the analysis done by IEA, um, they say something like you need 126 trillion of additional capex in order to decarbonize the world, especially in sectors such as utilities or electricity, uh, transport, buildings, and uh, a lot of industries as well. And then out of that, 56 trillion is actually in Asia. So I think from a opportunity standpoint, from a total addressable market standpoint, this space offers a lot of opportunities for investors to both do well and do good and to create value. Value in both sense of returns and value in the sense of better ESG outcomes. So I think the, the first point is to really underscore the importance of investors looking at this because this is ultimately an investment issue. Um, it's not about just doing marketing. Ultimately, um, these things do drive investment value. And as a you know, fiduciary, we have to have the responsibility to look at what we do in our investments from both the stock and the flow perspective. Now, you ask the question, what is stopping us from doing more? We're doing a lot, um, but it, there are a lot of challenges. Frankly, before this panel, um, I was telling them that you know the previous uh, two presentations basically have already summarized all the key challenges and most of the key challenges that we face. But if you want me to go to specific um, you know, sort of challenges, I think people talk about this data issue, which is really real. But beyond that, I mean, when you think about transition, it's also around what do you define as progress in transition? How do you measure that? How do you assess that? I think that is number one. And depending on which jurisdiction, which sector, and which industry you talk about, there could be differences. So for us, we believe that it's important to integrate sustainability considerations in the way that recognizes the diversity and the idiosyncrasies of the different markets we operate under. Because we want to be pragmatic, we want to be constructive. So if you impose a certain sort of top-down approach on a you know, decarbonization pathway across you know, every, port, every part of your portfolio, that is neither realistic nor constructive. So I think 
how do you define transition pathways? How do you measure? Um, how do you make sure that there is reporting requirement, the governance structure requirement? I mean, all of this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we're talking about in terms of challenges. And I can go on and on, but I think I better stop here and allow some of my yeah, other panelists uh, to do the talking. It helps to set the scene very well. And just, to, I mean, that 56 trillion number that you mentioned in Asia, it's just worth bearing in mind that the presentation that Nikhil, my colleague, gave earlier around the global public investors, the reserve managers, the, uh, the, the public pension funds and the sovereign wealth funds, that's around 50 trillion of assets in total that those people own. So that gives a scale of the challenge. Um, Wei Ling, tell us, uh, tell us about CBQ. You are a, a, a pension fund that's very active and vocal in this space, but I imagine you have challenges meeting what you would like to achieve. Well, I think, you know, being, you know, Canadian, you know, from Quebec specifically, I think the one good thing is that our internal stakeholders, meaning the pensioners, generally do believe in sustainability. So, so that is a, very, a real positive. The other real positive is that amongst our employees, 40% of our employees are under the age of 35. And that clearly is also something that everyone believes in, that this is the type of company that they want to work with. So, you know, we have always been deploying constructive capital. So whether it's, it's always about returns, but it's also about being a catalyst. So I think if you look at transition uh, financing, so we're talking about climate transition. So I've always said we've done the, the easier part. So we have exited oil and gas completely by end of last year. So, you know, that is the easy part. But, and then you look at what else we invest in, you know, the green fuel projects, renewables. That is relatively easier because you're starting from scratch. So whether you're looking at solar, whether you're looking at wind farm, whatever, you know, you're, when you're starting from scratch, it's easier. So now we are looking at transition. And that is tough. So you're looking at a highly carbon intensive sector, a highly carbon intensive company that has the ambition of transitioning and yet is accountable to make sure that they continue to provide, to meet the energy requirements of their local market. So that is tough, right? So we set aside a $10 billion wallet for transition finance. So that's US 10 billion. But the honest truth is we've, we've only deployed less than 10% of that. And you know, you will think that, come on, just in Asia alone, there are a ton of, of transition finance uh, requirement. But if for us to do transition finance in a responsible way to our, to our stakeholders, basically what we're expecting is that the company that we're investing in, this is today. They have to commit to a timeline of when are they going to decommission year by year, quarter by quarter. Concurrently, they would have to build sustainable energy year on year, quarter on quarter, such that over time, whatever the, the agreement is, whether it's five or 10 years, they will completely decommission the carbon intensive plant that they have. So the, all these sounds you know, fairly simplistic. Uh, I'm making it really sound really easy because, but obviously, the reputation, the quality of our partner comes in, that they have to believe in this, that they're going to do this year after year, quarter after quarter. Secondly, the domestic shareholders, I mean, sorry, the domestic stakeholders, be it the government, be it the local population, because when you decommission, you're affecting livelihoods, and those are the realities on the ground. So again, it is all you know, easier said than done, and that is why to us today, we, are, we, have, we have deployed less than 10%. But this is something that we seriously want to continue to pursue. So where, where, just can you give us more specifics on where these things are falling through? I mean, obviously, you're identifying opportunities and they're not quite coming off for you at the moment. Is it because the companies won't commit to what you think is needed? And, and do you have room for negotiation with them in that? Or where might you find the influence to change their mind? What might do that? You know, actually, we have a lot of you know, countries, actually governments, coming to us to say that you know, they need transition financing. So, and I'm sure we're not the only ones who are faced with such uh, requirements. So, but I, you know, ultimately, the company that owns the asset have to be accountable. 
and have to be very committed to subject themselves to external technical audits uh, and to also manage the domestic stakeholders, be it the local community, the local government, uh, because all of our interests need not be specifically aligned. So that is part of that challenge. Okay, I'm sure we'll come back to that some of that in a minute. Um, Snorra, the Norwegian sovereign fund, of course, it's no secret that the money comes effectively from the fossil fuels that we need to uh, transition away from. But but you are a an organization that has been active and leading in this field for a long time now. Um, tell us Tell us where you think some relatively quick wins might be had to move this forward, because clearly we heard from Katrina earlier, we're behind schedule here. Great, no, thank you. So just as a background on the fund, we, as you quite rightly say, we are the a savings fund for the Norwegian economy, we the, and, um, and our capital does come from these fuels. Um, so our starting point for this is really the financial arguments that are linked to, to the climate transition. So similar to, I think, um, what we've heard uh, earlier as well. So the fund is invested very broadly um, across different asset classes and across 70 different uh, markets. On average, we own 1.5% of global listed equity. So from our perspective, this really means that as a starting point, we have nowhere to hide from these risks. So whether it's, we saw in the presentation, the previous presentation, there's geopolitics, there's inflation, there's climate risk. All of this is going to affect our portfolio. So that means that we need to take an active role in terms of addressing these. It also means, um, in terms of our uh, investment horizon, it's very long term. So we're safeguarding wealth, not just for current generations, but also for future generations. So that means, one, we have a financial interest in an orderly transition. We've actually done a number of analyses that kind of back up this point. And secondly, as a very broadly diversified asset owner, we have an inherent interest in sustainable development to support our long-term returns. And that's, of course, in economic terms and social terms, also in environmental terms. So that's really the starting point for why these issues are important to us. I can get back in the, I can get, I'm sure we'll get back to more concrete tools in the conversation later, but the way we translate this into um, concrete action, it actually, the presentation from Bain actually uh, resonated a lot with some of the key tools that we use, because within this position as a globally diversified owner, some of the main tools we have to address this is really, one, it's around improving the markets where we invest, so it's around contributing to better standards, better measurement methodologies, including for transition pathways um, and understanding uh, where companies are progressing on that, um, to your point. Um, but also, of course, engaging the companies that we own. And when I say engaging, it's, of course, it's about being clear about our views and holding the companies accountable. But there is also, it's a two-way element to it. So it's also about listening to the challenges that the companies are facing and trying to understand how can we as an owner be supportive to actually, and be constructive in terms of helping them on um, this transition that we all just, uh, to be frank, have to go through. What's the balance though, between investments that you have already where you're trying to encourage those companies to be uh, more aligned to net zero and become better corporate citizens, shall we say, to some extent, or, or, the, or the ones where you are directly investing in companies that you think, ah, these companies will thrive through transition. They are, they are investments that we think will both help the transition but be very good investments in their own right. So, I mean, I think that our starting point is really we want to be an owner through the transition across this broadly, this broad universe. So we do have certain mechanisms where we, whereby we will not uh, be invested in a company due to climate-related concerns. But that is really not our preferred approach. That's a kind of pruning or ad adaptation we do to the portfolio to really weed out those companies where we think there is um, engagement is not going to help. This, the climate risk is too high for us to own them. And then that that kind of prunes the universe. But within that, it means we still have thousands of companies where we are invested, where our role is really to actively drive this transition. And within, within this universe, you will have everything from um, companies that are just getting started to companies that are more middle of the pack to companies that are really leading and the solutions provider. And one of the, I would say, sometimes our size can be a, it can, it can feel like a, a constraining factor, but one of the benefits of it, of being so broadly diversified, is that we actually get viewpoints from across, both across value chains and across um, different, uh, different, if you will, stages of where companies are. And we can actually use those insights in our own uh, engagement work, both to kind of cross-pollinate and help to shift towards more 
commonly accepted solutions in, um, in these various sectors. Thank you, sir. Uh, to, I'll come to you one second. Um, I just want to say you, you guys are a very good audience because I haven't even prompted you to post questions on Slido and they're already coming in. So thank you very much indeed to those who have posted. If you do want to post a question, use the QR code, scan it in, send it on, and we can see them. There's one here addressed directly to, uh, to, to Wai Leng. So I'll come to you, Wai Leng. Um, if you fully exited ONG and presumably coal, what areas or sectors are you looking at as transition opportunities? I'm asking you first, Wileng, and then we'll, we'll come to Tuha. Right. So, yeah. So, in terms of, you know, sustainability, if I'm, if I'm just talking about climate, um, then clearly it's, you know, we are, in, we are actually one of the world's top two uh, when it comes to investments, uh, equity invest, private equity investments in renewables. Um, so, that is definitely there. And then the second thing that we're looking at is that, look, you know, you know, if you look at this part of the world, including this building, we're talking about green buildings, right? But if you look at the materials that go into it, they're not very green. So whether it's cement, whether it's steel, you know, we're still really using technology that are not very sustainable. So we think that there's room for us to be exploring, so, uh, you know, when we're looking at materials, uh, when we're looking at energy storage, uh, like hydrogen. Um, so all of these are areas that we are, we are interested in um, I think we're still learning to, to, to kind of define, you know, which are the horses that we should bet on. Uh, but these are all, you know, I think the way forward in terms of the alternatives out there. Thank you, Wailing. Um, Too hard, not, not every asset owner is cast from the same mold as the three that we have on stage here. Um, you deal with a lot of them. Um, as, as, a, as, a, as a fund manager, an asset manager with a very, very strong focus on sustainability, and Rubico is known globally, I think, for its commitment to stability and has been for some time. What more can asset owners do? What, what, would, what, what would you like to see asset owners do to drive this forward more quickly? Yeah, but before I answer that, I'm going to say, before we ask of other people, we should ask, actually, what should asset managers do uh, to be a part of the ecosystem? So I think one of the... I, I mean, I spent 15 years in Europe, so I, I kind of understand that whole evolution in the last 12 years here in Asia. And there is a very different evolution of sustainability. So I think as asset uh, managers, we actually need to be equipping tools because we talked about a lot of the, the pain points such as data, et cetera. We need to actually provide some of those solutions, right? Uh, and how, I mean, um, how we're doing at Rubico is that, first of all, I think there's three things that we're focused on. Number one, regionalization. Secondly, operationalization. You can have ambitions, but if you can't operationalize them, it doesn't work. And then finally, humanization. And this is where we talk about engagement because these are complex issues. Uh, and I'll give you examples of how these things are, are being applied. For example, uh, Zhu uh, may talk about the sector decarbonization pathway. Uh, the way that they stood and we ran the whole index for it, a lot of Asian companies are failing, failing for multitude of reasons. Uh, uh, first of all, these were averages, global averages. So when you buy global averages, it doesn't work. So you've got to regionalize it to make it uh, you know, uh, actionable for companies that operate in that. Then when you go to that and we talked about credible transition, credible strategy, well, what do you mean by credibility? So I'll give you a very good example. I was in a, a committee last week and we said we had this company and we're comparing it to the global average and they're a global company and that sector decarbonization pathway that we project, projected did not meet you know, the global. And then I asked the analyst a simple question. I'm like, where are they operating? And I go, he said, oh, well, they're operating in places where there is no renewable. It is impossible for them to meet this target. I'm like, well, is this the right target? You're saying they're not credible, but you're also telling me there's nothing they can do about it until a certain technology. So this takes me to the third part of humanization of, of the whole process. When we have our engagement, and I think one of our engagement specialists said here, she said how important, the most important skill she has is to be able to listen, because we don't know the answers. And when we actually listen, they'll, they'll tell you things like, I can't do the things you've asked me to do because they're just not options I currently have beyond financing. And then you actually then change your credibility assessment, you 
you regionalize, you actually start to make stuff that are actionable. Then you come back to plans that are actually actionable and therefore encourages action. And I think this is where I think at least as um, asset managers, we need to kind of provide those to that transparency so that we go beyond looking at data uh, for what they are. For example, I mean, give you brilliant data. We all love ca uh, carbon data. They Not only are they backward looking, but if you have a company that is growing, you, the denominator is, is, is lagging, so they're always going to look like they, they, they have high intensity. Again, you have to make these allowances if you're going to get to a place where we actually get more capital deployed to a region that really needs it. So, so what you're saying here effectively is that, yes, data is important, but don't forget we're investors and we have to make judgment calls. And sometimes it might be that we meet someone who owns or runs a company who may not be able to exactly match the standards that we would normally require, but you can see looking them in the eyes that this is a company and a, and a, and a management team that will achieve something and therefore you make a judgment call. And, and actually, most excitingly, this is what I tell our, 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 our um, kind of portfolio manager, and actually it's one of the few times actually we can make a difference. So we can go to a company, we have a great engagement uh, uh, case right now, where we're saying to them, we're trying to give them extra information to actually build this. We've said, if you don't uh, make sure that you give a certain data, we're not going to be able to assess you properly. And then so they will go back and go, OK, actually, how do I provide data that people want? Because actually, they, they didn't even know that those are the, the requirements. These are, we're not talking about people intentionally wanting to like, um, you know, um, mislead. It's just that they just don't know these, and these are we rarely know what we want. So let alone we're asking companies. So I think the engagement process is so important to actually bridge that and actually to educate ourselves about the, if we're really are about real life economic decarbonisation and actually not just portfolio. Portfolio decarbonisation is a lot easier by divestment. Real life uh, decarbonisation takes a lot harder work, but that's what we really need. Jimmy, I see you nodding. It'd be interesting to know again. You know, I mean, obviously, this issue around data and and and, uh, and, and scoring and measuring is is a big one, but is it an insurmountable one? Are the ways not necessarily around it, but through it as well? That it doesn't have to be. It shouldn't be a barrier, an insurmountable barrier to making investments of the type that we're discussing. No, I think it's important to build on Duha's point, which is that ultimately it is about the real world decarbonisation that we should try to contribute to. It's not just about portfolio decarbonization, because if you want to get to portfolio decarbonization, it's called divestment. I mean, you can get it fairly quickly, although there's a big cost to it. But I think the ultimate question is, does that really help the real world to decarbonize? So I think when you come back to the North Star in terms of what you believe in and how you drive sustainability, you have to be very clear ultimately what is the objective for your fund and what do you believe in. So for us, this is ultimately... The, the, the one North Star that's driving us, which is that we're a long-term investor. We are here also with a fund that is for multi-generations of Singaporeans. And ultimately, what we want to do is to be able to contribute and enable that decarbonization in the real world. So when you think about that from that perspective, then it's about looking at opportunities where you can have ability to help that decarbonization. Um, so data and whatever methodology, that is the how. That is the technical aspects of how we get through it. But fundamentally, I think it's important that when you work with specific companies, you really have to get down to the local situation, understand the real challenges they're facing, and then find a way that is pragmatic, find a way that is constructive. Otherwise, you know, imposing whatever standard that if they can't do it, they don't have renewables, that's not helpful. Um, so I think the issue here is not about data or, you know, these things I think over time will get to a better place. Uh, sure, this is a huge challenge, but fundamentally, um, we believe that the, the ultimate question is around how do you think about ways in which investors can help in enabling this decarbonization in the real world. So for example, um, Asian utilities, we have this tie up with AIGCC. Uh, it's a pilot program. It's called a Asian Utilities Engagement uh, program. So Asian utilities, as you know, uh, actually account for one of the largest or highest carbon emissions in the world, something like 23% of total carbon emissions in the world. And we partner with uh, a few other asset owners and investors, and we work with a set of these companies to talk through their plans on decarbonization, as well as coming to some sort of credible but realistic decarbonization and transition strategy. So for example, under this program, 
um, CLP has committed to phasing out coal in 2040, and we have Tanaga by 2050, PLN by 2060. As you can see, these are quite differentiated approach because the starting point is so different. So I think if investors can forget about the data and the, and the index, I see a lot of questions around index, but really go down to that basic fundamental understanding of what we're trying to achieve here from investment standpoint and what we're trying to do in terms of our impact uh, to allow or enable this transition and to decarbonize the real economy, then I think you come from a very different place to think about the strategy to get there rather than be driven by data index or anything else. At the end of the day, you are big experienced investors and you know risk reward. So if you know that a set of standards is maybe not quite so tight, you factor that into the level at which you might invest as well, right? So this is, it's another investment opportunity. Indeed, I think it's both an opportunity, but also to take care of the risks, because clearly regulations are coming fast and furious in various shapes and forms. I mean, just don't look too far. I mean, just in Singapore, um, the government announced that we're going to increase carbon price from $5 this year to 25 next year, and to reach something like 50 to $80 in, uh, by 2030. Now, if you are impacted by that, just that's a 10 to 16 fold increase in just a short span of six, seven years. So ultimately, it impacts your bottom line. So companies have to realize that the rules of the game have changed, consumer behaviors are changing. You really have to think about how to be sustainable in order to be profitable. So I think once people align that longer term sustainability goals with alignment with the returns, frankly, actually a lot of things are um, in, in some sense straightforward. The question, of course, is the short term. How do you deal with the nearer term issues of energy security and all sorts of issues? And this is where I think you can't really have a top-down approach. You really have to go down to the bottom-up individual cases and find a way that is realistic, find a way that is um, pragmatic and, and I said again, constructive, because that's the only way to allow for that transition. Otherwise, you just dump it and you sell it to someone else. It doesn't really solve the problem. Um, Snorri, just to come to you now, just on a couple of things. One, just to follow up on that uh, that question about sh to what extent is data uh, an insurmountable barrier or, or, or what can you do to continue to invest uh, without necessarily always having the data standards required? And secondly, just to, uh, to take a question from, that was being posted from the floor, um, how do you manage positions in companies that miss or delay their interim targets? Are there acceptable reasons when you're, if you're marking their scorecard and they fail, what do you do? Great, thanks. So there are two quite different questions, but when the first one on data, I don't think, I think I wouldn't say it's an insurmountable challenge, but it's a very real challenge. One of the, um, one of the things that's um, most important for us to contribute to in this sense is really to have strong standards for, um, that, that say something about uh, company disclosures and practices. So strong disclosure standards that are ideally comparable across markets. So we've been very supportive of, for example, the efforts of the ISSB to, sh to, to mold this global baseline of sustainability reporting because we see that from our perspective as an investor, this will help us give more comparable information across all the 70 markets where we invest. We also think that for the companies, it will harmonize the asks or the, what they are being asked for if there are stronger kind of standards that they can deliver and more harmonized standards that they can deliver against. So this is actually one of the important um, kind of tools we actually have in our toolbox when it comes to addressing this, this data gap. There's also a positive spiral here in that more companies disclosing against the same standard will ultimately um, give, give us, uh, give the markets better information which will help them price in some of these, um, some, of, some of these risks. So apart from ISSB, we've also been very involved with um, an initiative called the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. Nature is an important um, and inextricably linked aspect with the climate transition. SGX has also been leading in driving this work. So this is just an example of how we, how we as a global asset owner can contribute to some of these important uh, developments. So that's the first question. The second question, how we manage positions in companies um, that miss or delay their interim targets. That's a very, it's a big question. So again, how we would manage it here is to use the tools that we have um, available to us. So we do, in the first instance, it's about engagement. And uh, to your point as well, engagement is, it's about setting clear expectations and following them up. It's also about listening to the, what the challenges are and trying to understand if there is um, what, what is this individual company situation and 
what is the commitment, trying to get more of a qualitative sense of how, what is the willingness and ability to transition here. In the cases where we don't, um, where engagement does not really yield, or dialogue doesn't yield um, the satisfactory results, um, then we would consider first maybe a slightly more hard-hitting tools, such as, for example, supporting shareholder proposals or even voting against board members. Um, to signal very clearly that we think there is climate risk here that is not being adequately managed by this company. We see in most instances that these, these tools will work um, either in, together or by themselves. When we vote against board members, for example, where we do this, uh, we disclose this publicly, we disclose it five days ahead of AGM to signal our concern to the market, and we also disclose the rationale for voting against. So to a company, that's quite a powerful signal. But it is a signal. We only we tend to own. I said we own 1.5% um, of the world's global uh, listed equity. That also means that we're always a minority investor. So we're not. We don't control the companies in that sense. And then we have kind of the extreme for us, which would be considering um, divestment. But that's re for us. That's really only something we want to do if we see that we have exhausted the other engagement tools. Um, but how often has that actually happened? That you've you've had to divest. So if we. If we look at um, if we look at the investment universe, I think since 2012 we have divested from it's um, I think it's around four, it's slightly over 400 companies for various reasons related to heightened sustainability risks. So, um, but if we you think about that, we own 9,000 companies. It's not a huge percentage, and the, these are also tend to be smaller companies where we've also seen that our our engagement efforts are just really not leading to anything. So it's it's a more kind of, um, what should I say, pragmatic tool to use. Well, and same for you in terms of how do you, how do you mark the scorecards of your investments and what do you do if they're underperforming? Sure. You know, I think our scorecard is a bit broader. So, I mean, I know today we're talking about climate, um, but in reality, our scorecard, if we, you know, you know, I don't know whether I can still use the word ESG, but, you know, let's use ESG. Um, so we, we do, you know, part of it is obviously climate. Uh, so that's carbon intensity. But we are also looking at diversity and inclusivity as part of our, uh, you know, scorecard. We are also looking at taxation uh, because we want to make sure that the companies where we have, you know, significant exposure to that, they are paying what we deem as fair tax. So regardless of which sector, regardless of where they are registered, uh, we do want them to pay 15% because we think that that's being a responsible corporate citizen to enable the, the, the local economy to function. So, so that's taxation. And then lastly, governance. So these four are on our scorecards. And so, um, you know, very similar to, to everybody else, uh, when we have sizable positions where we get to vote, but before we get to vote, actually we have actually invested quite significantly over the last, I would say, three years or so on what we call operating partners. So these operating partners would actually be working with the companies that we have invested in, whether they're public or private, to guide them uh, or to work with them to kind of learn, you know, what are the challenges? Do we have other portfolio companies that could help? Can we help? Do we have the expertise internally on all of these uh, benchmark indices? So, so that has been, uh, I would say, quite a shift uh, for us for, at CDPQ that we've invested significantly uh, in this particular operating partner uh, group. Thank you. Suha, what's the, what's the role of the asset manager in all of this? I mean, uh, I think, you know, first of all, we always say we're just a servant to, to what our masters want. So it's clear that, that different asset managers, um, asset owners have very different requirements. And I think we, we need to make sure that we have the tooling to help first of all, illuminate what's going on, because unless you know what's going on, and, and as I say, it's not, an, it's not as easy as it seems, it's very intricate. Uh, we have a, a, a very big team who, who can help us with kind of understanding, you know, tech, I don't know what technology is really available to one company or another. They, we have to get to that granular level, because if you're gonna say someone is credible or not credible, you better make sure that you're managing it fairly, because I think that's one of the danger that you hide behind data to, to get through that. Um, but I think, uh, thirdly, that you, you continue to do research to actually illuminate the situation and then actually provide that to your, your clients for them to actually make those decisions and to help them bring them along that journey of, of 
not having to do everything yourself, I think it's, it's hard, but having that expertise and then having that confidence to create their own, as you say, their, their uh, different asset uh, owners have different objectives. I think we, we have a kind of face this term kind of 3D investing, you know, risk return and sustainability. You tell us what you need in those, and then we will create a, a, around what you need and, and the toolings that are the surrounds. And that's the thing, that's the, the partnership that, that is, we're hoping to build with our clients. Thank you. Um, I just want to, I want to talk a little bit about Asia now, um, specifically. Um, and and Suha, as the as a as a Asia senior Asian executive of a European based or headquartered at least organization, how how do how does the international the global investment community view Asia in terms of the sustainable investment challenges? Let me kind of just run data that actually has, has been done by Mobilis. You know, you can, Unfortunately, the mainstream of ESG has actually meant that actually flow into ESG investment for the Asia region has actually declined. That's just, that's not an opinion, that's just a fact. And I think it's very important for, you know, I mean, for Rubico, we've obviously established a hub here with sustainability, with sustainable experts on the ground to make sure that our European counterpart really understand the situation. Uh, we kind of said, the, the battle for climate is won and lost by what happens in this region. So you need to get, to, you've got to uh, get, I mean, and Singapore is a brilliant place where there is so much uh, research and stuff going on as a hub and actually to communicate that back. We're in the same battle together. This is not, you know, uh, you know, the, the climate doesn't have border. It doesn't really care where your emissions come from. It cares, and, and so therefore having that uh, local knowledge and actually bringing that uh, perspective back uh, you know, helps us to actually become better at understanding the whole global system. And I think that's a lot of that needs to continue to happen. I think Singapore really spearheading, creating the kind of uh, capacity for us to be able to do that is, is quite important. And we need to do a lot more of it. Thank you. Uh, and same to you, Sonora. I think you've recently relocated here to this region, haven't you? Is that right? Yes, this is my third week here. So I, I can't, I can't be, I can't. Uh, Used to the heat yet, Sonora? Um, I'm adapting to it, yeah. Uh, but uh, t tell us again how, I mean, obviously you have 1.3 trillion, I think, under management. You are active everywhere. We know that Asia is such an important part of this transition finance discussion. So so going back to sort of headquarters, how, how is Asia as, a, as an investment location, particularly around sustainability views? So, I mean, just... Again, just to take a step back and state some maybe obvious things. So Asia, it's, it's around 16% uh, uh, of our equity portfolio's value is represent is uh, invested in Asian companies. As we all know, Asia is also a hugely important in the value chains of many of the other companies where we're invested. So I think it's important for us to try and understand this region as as much as we can and to have a, a local presence. We also have a an office in Singapore that we've had for, I think it's around a decade. Um, so uh, we see, obviously, that the region is key to global decarbonization. We also see that the region has a stake in, uh, in climate risk when it comes to being exposed uh, to physical climate risk. So all of these, um, all of these factors are things that, import that are important for us to, to consider. Um, I also think, again, uh, coming back again to this point about engagement also being an avenue to learn, I also think there is a tremendous amount that we can learn uh, also back at our head office from the things that are happening in Asia, how the decarbonization is playing out. A lot of the trends we're seeing in terms of regulatory development, especially in Singapore, some of the examples that have already been, been mentioned. So all of these are things that are going to, uh, is information that's important to us with regards to being a global investor that has a significant presence in Asia and also is going to be here for the long term. Thank you. And to, and to stay on the subject of Asia, Jumi, in, in terms of I mean, this is such a diverse region. We're sitting here in Singapore, which is a highly developed capital market, very well regulated, very, very well run, with some very, very impressive finance institutions. It's not the case in every country in Asia. And I wonder how you look at the more emerging parts of Asia um, and whether you feel that in those parts of the, of, of the region, governments could do more. Our well, short answer is yes, but at the same time, I think we have to be realistic to understand that there are other competing demands and priorities for many of these countries on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, people have to talk about social economic challenges and so on. I mean, just to give you a very specific example, let's say you want to phase out coal-fired power plants. Um, in Indonesia, the life or span or the current life of the uh, coal in Indonesia is about only 13 years. Um, in Germany, it's 35 years. 
and technically they have about 40 year lifespan. So I think from that as a starting point, you, you now have to really appreciate that it is a very different starting point. It's easier if you're having a 35 year old plant and you want to phase that out, but if you only have a very young plant and then you say, let's throw this out and then by the way, I haven't got my renewable energy and you know, an, an infrastructure in place, that is just not realistic at all. Um, so I think for us looking at, you know, the opportunity set around um, ESG transition sustainability, um, it, it has to be multi-pronged approach. It has to be differentiated by locations. Um, so for us, I think we've been split the wall into that three buckets that I just talked about, the green and sustainable, the so-called very high um, carbon emissions and potentially even stranded and then everything in between. Um, you, I think we have to have differentiated strategy to deal with each bucket. High level, we want to grow the green assets by really focusing on sustainable solutions, decarbonization solutions, some of these things like uh, renewable energy, hydrogen, carbon capture, the latest technology. We have teams um, who are already set up to focus on those opportunities, but obviously very early stage in technology, lots of uh, challenges. Uh, but I think the opportunities is actually growing quite quickly and the reward could be huge if they could be a game changer in terms of helping us as part of the solutions for decarbonization. Um, in the extreme left, this is where the very high commission, uh, high emission of carbon is. Uh, we do stress testing in terms of things like carbon pricing and so on, and whether or not there are viable transition plans that could help them decarbonize. But if not, we will actually divest. But that is upon a more bottom-up approach of understanding whether or not they are realistic plans to allow them to get out that, of the stranded asset risks. Um, and then in the middle is really this whole transition around understanding which companies where we have more leverage in terms of either our ability to uh, go with the management, talk to the management, work with other asset owners, as well as frankly the percentage of ownership of those companies. And these are some of the considerations. And at the end of the day, there's so much to do. Um, we just have to prioritize to look at how to have the best bang for the effort, right, for the buck in, in some sense. Um, and um, your questions around Asia, there are really a lot of things that we can do. Uh, for example, in Philippines, we have uh, worked with AC Energy. Um, they are trying to get to net zero by 2050. They're trying to build renewables. Um, so they're trying to phase out coal by 2040. So part of this investments really help along building the renewable energy capacity, but at the same time, you know, really um, uh, retiring some of this coal-fired power, power plant, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I think in every situation, we really need the ground teams to look at them from the perspective of, okay, what is um, the longer-term transition plans, as well as whether or not um, ultimately we could get to an outcome where we get can do well and do good. Thank you, Jimmy. Well, and just to, to let us know a little bit again on, on, on CBQ and your particular investment approach to the more emerging parts of Asia, the more developing parts of Asia? Okay, actually, you know, I was going to jump on the topic that because we talk about Asia, so clearly Asia is very, very diverse. And we know that, um, you know, it's what I've always said it's Western Europe plus Eastern Europe, and then you kind of mix it up and that's Asia. Um, so I, I actually think that, you know, I want to bring up the, the topic of blended finance. Uh, so I think this is something which I believe in the afternoon, you know, we'll start talking about it. But I think in this part of the world, especially with the developing, the emerging market, as well as the tier below emerging markets, the, the, the concept of blended finance will have to come in. If we're trying to do things with scale. Because, you know, again, with, with all of the, you know, with all of us, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, we will continue to assess every opportunity you know, in a very constructive manner. But if we're going to make a difference to the entire ecosystem, uh, then I think in this part of the world in particular, we need blended finance. And again, depending on who you talk to, you probably, you know, all of us probably have a different definition, but I'll share my definition. Um, so that's where you need the government, the local government to step up. You would need private sector, and that's including institutional investors, that's including the financial uh, banking sector. Uh, whom I believe are very committed. And then you need developmental uh, capital. So whether you're talking about the multilaterals, development, developmental agencies, they need to come in as well. And then lastly, perhaps there are you know, philanthropy. 
uh, capital. So the reason why we need so many of these stakeholders is that each of us will have to be comfortable with the respective risk reward uh, based on what we can accept. Because there's no running away from the fact that I'm ultimately still accountable to all the pensioners sitting in Quebec. I, can't com I cannot compromise my risk reward. So as a result, I think for this part of the world, um, particularly for the emerging market and the tier below, we need blended finance. No, no one wants a first loss tranche, do they? That's the problem. Right. So we we attempted a, a billion dollars. Um, you know, ultimately we didn't we didn't cross the finishing line, uh, and but we continue uh, to be working on it. Um, um, so I'll let everyone know if we manage to cross the finishing line. But so because I believe that there are several you know parties out, you know just just in this hall alone. I think we want to be able to contribute and yet meet the risk return. So I think it's about can we find you know, one solution, and perhaps that can be replicated uh, across many markets, across many sectors. Um, it's, a, it's ambitious, it's very, very ambitious, but I think it can be done. There'll be a panel of multilateral development banks that you can ask a question to this afternoon if you want. Um, I think that will be an interesting discussion. That will be another interesting debate. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about ownership and we've talked a lot about investment, and, and most of the discussions probably focus more on equity um, ownership and shareholders. Um, we've got two people with who are sustainable experts but also have fixed income in their title and I wanted to quickly explore where the fixed income markets might develop in this. It seems to me and my colleagues sometimes when we look at this market that there are there are very securitizable streams of revenues and securitization mar market globally is huge whether it's in green leases, green cars, whatever it may be, a whole stream of things that could do that but but the green bond markets in and of themselves have not developed maybe in the way that people wanted. Uh, and maybe more needs to be, more, more, needs, more thought needs to go into how fixed income products should develop. So, Suha, maybe I could ask you to talk on that first and I'll come to you, Junie. Yeah, but I mean, we were just talking about, I was speaking about over the break. I mean, the problem with a true definition of green, that only accounts for, for you know, estimates between 10 to 15% of the economy. So if you just spoke, and, and I guess it is easy because we can just carve out the use of proceeds, give yourself a tick in the back, and then we're kind of home and happy, right? It's a bit like kind of having a low carbon um, uh, portfolio. You, 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 you feel good, but actually it doesn't help. So it, that is an important part, and it's a very good start, but it's not enough. I do think that we need to uh, move that beyond green to you know, transition as a different definition to enable you said the rest of the economy, which is not clear, because we don't want to actually dilute the definition of green. We just know that not everything can be green. You can't be a renewable company. That's not. That's just not the economy. So that's that's the second part of development that I think is needed to be having a kind of clear way of thinking, of defining, and uh, getting instruments for transition financing. Fixed income is very important because, you know, these are long-term capital requirements. And the problem is NPV back and all of these things, you do need that longevity. So I think that's why I think, uh, and they're big projects that need to be had. They're usually done by government, so therefore they're not necessarily the private sectors, uh, maybe the, the ones doing that. And so I think these type of, uh, in, uh, this, the market needs to develop in that and it needs to develop in a way we, so we can scale up. And right now, a lot of smaller projects, smaller countries don't actually, they, they don't really, uh, can't, can't access that market. And again, we have to figure out how we, we make sure that that um, becomes available, as you say, maybe as really mentioned, through blended or through uh, grouping up of assets to be able to do that. Thank you. Shumi, do you think the fixing a market should be developing more in this respect? Um, certainly. I think the green bond market in itself is a good starting point, but frankly, that is very backward looking because you basically have ring fans, whatever green projects that you have to raise green you know, proceeds. But the reality is what we want is something that's more forward-looking, something that's biting in terms of ensuring that transition. So something like sustainability-linked bonds where you put in specific, you know, uh, commitment targets for companies to meet and if they don't do that, if they don't meet those targets, you get compensated with higher coupon or whatever. I think that is a lot more forward-looking, that is uh, more encompassing in terms of getting the entire company and organization to go through uh, in terms of the total operations rather than just a specific project that could be just under green. So I think um, having ways to align that transition 
um, is a lot more impactful than the green bond market. That's one. I think two um, is that when you look at the amount of transition we need to go through, something like the 126 trillion we just talked about, a lot of it will need to come in debt form. Uh, not everything is about equities. The question, of course, is how do you make sure that many of these debt will go into financing the right um, you know, capex to allow for decarbonization and the blended finance idea, I think it's important. I believe, for example, MAS announced that they're going to come up with uh, something like a carbon um, or tax credit for uh, people for, to, to have early retirement of coal fire power plants because otherwise it's very difficult for um, the company themselves to just completely you know, um, uh, you know, retire this on their own without some sort of help. So I think some of these designs in terms of how we think about future of financial instruments, structure, and in terms of um, the stack of securitization, maybe the first loss piece should be something like a public sector uh, responsibility because otherwise it's very difficult to scale. Um, and I think what we need is that scale here. It's not just about recognizing that there, there are a lot of things to do, but we want to have the speed for us to be able to get up to the decarbonization pathway. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're starting to run out of time. Um, so I'm going to finish with a question that's based on a dinner that we had last night with, with some of the speakers here today and some of our partners. Uh, and, and my boss, John Orchard, asked a question. And you, you're not allowed to say both is the key thing to this question. You have to choose one or the other. And the question was, in the end, who will be more responsible for driving transition finance forward, the public sector or the private sector, in terms of if we, if we are to achieve our goals? So you're only allowed to choose one. And why, why is that a constraint? I don't understand. Is that not even necessarily a constraint. It's just necessary? Tr it's, try it's, trying, it's trying to understand exactly, you know, what obviously it will be a blended answer, but, but which... Which of the two, in the end, will have to actually be the one that drives drives the transition? If you, if, if you go first, Nora. Then we'll Thank you for that. I mean, with the caveat that I, we don't, I don't see it as a binary, a binary thing. But I do. I think um, what I think is interesting with the public-private partnership is this this interplay. So. I mentioned standard setting earlier. One of the one of the developments we have seen is private sector coming together to build to create some of these um, standards that can be used across markets, and then later seeing public sector uh, sometimes going to the step of mandating these standards. So I think these dynamics are very important to uh, to drive the transition. To be honest. Thank you, Wailing. I was going to say I refuse to answer, but. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think I'll choose private. Um, and the reason why I'm choosing private is that I think if enough private capital bands together, uh, and I believe there are enough like-minded private investors out there, uh, we can then force a conversation with the government and to be able to do, you know, investments with scale. Because I keep coming back to the point of scale, because this is clearly needed. If we're going to meet all of our targets without scale, all of us will continue to do what we do every day, which is we look at individual investments. But to have that scale and that impact, then you actually need kind of, you know, the private sector to bend together to influence government decisions. Obviously, the government can do the same thing. They bend together and to change the, the behavior of the private. But I'm a bit more pessimistic with that, so I, I tend to be a little bit more, pop, you know, more more optimistic with the private sector. Thank you. Please. Policy. I, I really think that's the the glue that ties public and and, and private together. Uh, for example, we were doing some research. The fact is that when we when regulations came uh, about uh, in terms of looking at green financing, we didn't actually consider. We we actually focused on mitigation and we actually did not consider adaptation. That is a massive disadvantage for developing countries. And that was just a definitional thing. So policy has a massive avenue to drive both the public and the private sector. So I'm gonna default to a third option is actually it's about policy. And with a lot of policy make, with, with your influence as a policy maker, we have to get the policy right to actually move both sides. Pleasure. And who should drive the policy, public or private? I think it, would be, it should be the academics because it needs a third party to actually understand the systems and to understand the unblocking the system. We will always have to talk from our point of view, but there is a higher level than us, and I do still believe that, that, that there's a role for the academia to play.
I can, she'll be fun with you. I think by now you know the answer. We think it's not necessarily to, to choose A, and B, frankly, you really need everybody to play a role because it's impossible to rely on one. But if you put a gun on my head and say, I have to pick one, and if I look at the evidence that we see over the last few years, I think public sector is actually quite key. Just think about IRA in the US before and after, and think about the catalytic impact it has in drive a lot of the investments uh, before and after. I mean, you see the, the sharp change in terms of just the amount of capital that goes into that space and um, you know, some of the innovations that we're seeing today. Just think about China. Um, the moment that green and EV becomes part of the national agenda, just look at the amount of EVs that we've seen in China and the type of industries and the type of companies that have come out, and they just leapfrog to be the number one automobile car maker in the world, you know, from you know, nowhere before. So I, I think having the right policies, having the right push from the government, and then the partnership and private capital, you really need everybody to play a role in this. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I have no doubt that it is people like we have on stage now that will play a very important role in driving transition and that maybe there's a fourth answer that actually it's investors, whether public or private, that can really make a difference. So I'm putting the pressure on you guys now, but, but I hope that proves to be the case. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've quickly run out of time. So please, please, please put your hands together to thank our fantastic panelists. Thank you.